Resin cast with a copper finish. Today we're going to show how to create a realistic antique copper finish over a resin cast piece. Now this technique could be used over a lot of uh, resin cast pieces. In this particular instance we're going to be using our new BR75D. This is a brushable formula of resin that's ideal for brushing up thin cast parts or making mother molds. Now the first thing we'll need to do is prepare our mold for casting. Now since we'll be applying some of our copper B metal coating and primer over the uh, top of the resin cast, we want it to have a nice matte surface that will really help grab that metal coating. So I'm brushing some, uh, some of our matting powder. You could use baby powder or cornstarch, but just brush that all over the inside of the leaf mold. And this is a, a leaf mold made with Platzil gel tin over an actual elephant ear leaf. And we didn't make a mother mold for this because we wanted each cast to come out slightly different so we'd get a, a more organic look to the finished resin cast. And now we're ready to start applying our BR75D. Now those of you who have been following our Instagram page are probably well aware of this resin and some of the things we've made on Instagram with this product. This is a very unique formula of resin in that it is a self-thickening formula. Uh, once the two components are mixed together, if they thicken to a very uh, thick gel, almost like a sour cream kind of consistency, so it's ideal for uh, brushing on mother molds or brushing in casts. And if you do it very carefully, you can get very nice bubble-free casts by brushing this into a silicone mold. Now the BR75D has a very simple mix ratio of 100A to 50B, or basically 2 to 1. So in this case, uh, for our first batch that we're applying here, we're going to mix up 300 grams of part A with 150 grams of part B. Now when the two components combine, and when they're thoroughly mixed together, they convert from a liquid to a brushable gel, about the consistency of a thick hair gel or like sour cream. So remember that as soon as you put those two components together, you have about five to seven minutes working time, and then about a two to three hour demold depending on the cross section of the part. Now we're going to apply this with a chip brush. Always a good idea any for any time you have a brushable application with either a silicone or a polyurethane, resin or rubber, or whatever, make sure you use a disposable brush because any of these materials that catalyze and turn into a solid will ruin any other type of brush. So make sure you're using a cheap brush that you don't mind throwing away when you're done with the application process. Now one of the things I always like to do when I'm mixing up a resin system like this and for a brush on application is I like to get it out of the mixing cup and spread out as soon as I can. And the reason for that is when it's in a thick mass it generates more heat and that's going to diminish the working time. So make sure you get it spread out as soon as you can so you get as much of that working time as possible because you'll find if you leave it in the cup and work out of the cup little by little you'll find that you have a, a very short working time on the remainder of the batch that's in the cup in that thick mass. So make sure you get that spread out and then focus on getting a bubble free surface. And again you have five to seven minutes working time so that's ample time for a piece like this to make sure we get that brushed into all the detail of our mold. And then once we get that uh, applied we're going to come back around the edge of the mold with a popsicle stick to uh, take back that edge because we want to make sure we have as little of cleanup as possible on the edge of this part. So here we're just using a clean popsicle stick to work that edge and clean up any excess that's dripped over the side of the mold. And the overall thickness that we're going for here on this part is uh, we want it to eventually be right around a quarter of an inch thick. So we're applying this in two layers. This first layer we applied is just under an eighth of an inch thick. And obviously it's going to be a little thicker and a little bit thinner in some areas, but we want that to be as uniform as we can get it. And once that cures to a point where we can apply more resin without disturbing that first layer, we're ready to mix up our second batch. And of course, again, the mix ratio is 2 to 1 or 100 to 50. And in this instance, we're mixing up 400 grams of part A and 200 grams of part B. And this time I'm adding some brown polycolor. And the reason for that is that helps us differentiate between those two batches and helps us see where that second batch goes. And that way we get uniform coverage with that second batch. And we applied the second batch at about an hour after the first batch was applied. So 
So the first layer was still a little bit uh, on the tacky side, but it wasn't pulling up when you touched it. And that's important there. We don't want to disturb that first batch by applying the second batch. So when in doubt, wait just a little bit longer and apply it, uh, say, in an hour and a half, two hours if necessary. Now again, we're going to brush that all over the surface of our mold. You notice that we got it out of the mixing cup and spread across the surface as soon as possible. And that means that we don't have that buildup of heat in that mixing cup. Now obviously that's not going to be possible with every application, but you want to be mindful of that. And you'll be able to tell when you're holding that mixing bucket in one hand, when it starts to get really hot, that's a good indicator that uh, you're nearing the end of your working time. Now again here we're going back with a popsicle stick and pulling back that edge just to clean it up a little bit and minimize the uh, sanding or cleanup we'll have to do on the cured part. And the other thing we're going to do since this ultimately will become a wall hanging, we're going to embed some hanging hard hardware and uh, for that we've got some steel wire that uh, we've bent into a little U shape here and we're going to uh, just very carefully just smear some additional 75D on the backs of the uh, wires, those wires that we've doubled up there, and that will bond that into place. And once that cures, that wire will become part of the finished piece and will easily hold the weight of the final sculpture. So we want to make sure that we get that bonded in really good, and that's one of the reasons we doubled up those ends really good, so that they don't pull out of that resin once it's cured. Now, as I mentioned before, the BR75D has a working time of five to seven minutes and then a demold time of about two to three hours. And this, this particular piece took more, uh, more closer to the uh, three hour end of the spectrum because of the thin cross section. You'll find that thicker cross section pieces uh, take a shorter amount of time to demold because they build up more heat. Whereas a thinner cross-section part like this will be a little bit longer demold. And I'm actually demolding this a little bit early. You notice that this cast is still a little bit flexible. And that's okay. For this particular cast, we actually want that. Because at that stage, if we need to, we can warp this leaf to give it some extra contours that it doesn't have right now in the mold. Uh, but more importantly, at this stage, it's very easy to trim. So we can come back with a craft knife or even scissors and trim back that edge. And once we've uh, trimmed that back, ready, let it uh, cure completely and apply our primer. Now for this piece, we'll be priming it using our new Primate primer. And this is a water-based, no VOC primer. So it's a very a nice alternative to uh, some of the Rust-Oleum primers and some of those uh, spray paint type primers. Uh, this is very easy to apply. And with that uh, matting powder that I brushed into the surface of the mold, that's really gonna help grab that primer and help it adhere to that resin surface. Now, one of the nice advantages to the Sculpt Nouveau Primate Primer is that it doesn't have a window that's uh, typical of a lot of primers where you have a very specific window where you then need to follow it up with whatever base coat or whatever type of paint you're going to apply with to it. Uh, in this case, as soon as you apply that uh, Primate Primer, you're ready to apply your Copper B metal coating. And even if you wait a few days, you can still apply that metal coating right on top of it without any issue. Now this is our copper B metal coating that we'll be applying to the surface to get our copper finish. And we're going to apply this in two coats. And if you've watched some of our other videos or followed some of this on Instagram, you might have already seen this process. Overall, it's a fairly simple, pretty basic process. But the copper B metal coating, unlike a copper paint, actually contains real copper powder and a lot of it. So what it does is it allows us to have a surface that will actually oxidize like real copper because it is. So what we're going to do is put on a base coat of copper B and brush that all over the surface of our part. And then we're gonna come back and stipple out those brush strokes. And that's an important step. Once we get that brushed on an even coat all over the, the surface of our part, we wanna take a either a sponge or a brush, but stipple out those brush strokes. Because if we leave those in, it's going to look like a painted on surface. And one way around that, obviously we could put this in a spray gun and apply it with a sprayer. But for most of us uh, with a setup like a basic shop setup, brush application is going to be the most common and that's an easy way to get a, a nice looking part with a brush application. So once we've stippled that on, we're ready to let that dry 
And once that's dry to the touch, we're ready for our second coat of copper B. Now our second coat, now timing is really key here. In order to get a nice oxidized uh, copper surface, what we have to do is apply that copper B all over the surface of our part again, and also, again, we're going to follow that up by stippling out those brush strokes. And once we've done that, we need to very quickly transition to applying our patina. And that's an acid patina, so we want to make sure we immediately apply that while that copper B metal coating is wet on the second coat. If we allow that to dry, we're going to get little if no reaction on the surface of our part. So now that we have our second layer applied, we're ready for our patina. And again, this is an acid patina, and we're actually using two different colors to get the uh, green that I wanted here. I actually used a combination of the light green patina and the Tiffany green patina together. So I'm putting those on at these little spray bottles, and uh, you can apply this with a plant spray or any other kind of little mister bottle, but just know that that is an acid patina and a very strong acid, so it will destroy the springs in those little spray bottles. So eventually you'll need to transfer that to a uh, different spray bottle once that spring rusts. And now we're going to see a quick time lapse of that patina developing. And typically this will take a few hours for the color to fully develop. And for the best results, you want a mild temperature and as high of humidity as you can get. Uh, temperatures that are conducive to creating rust will obviously produce good, rich patinas. And this particular color developed in about uh, six hours. And once the color is where we want it and the piece is dry, we're ready to seal it with a clear lacquer. And in this case, we're sealing it with our clear guard lacquer. And this particular lacquer is, uh, has UV and corrosion inhibitors. And that's real important when you're applying a lacquer over a surface like this that has a patina uh, color to it. Because if it doesn't have that corrosion inhibition, what will happen is that patina will continue to change as the uh, part ages. Now if we want, that could be the end right there. We could stop there and we'd have a very nice looking piece. But I wanted to take it a little step further and show you how to uh, make it look like some of that copper is exposed through that patina. What we're going to do here is over that lacquered surface, and we gave that lacquer about two hours to completely cure. And then I came back and dry brushed some copper B over the high points of the piece. And we want to do that very carefully. We don't want to overdo that, just so it looks like some of that is naturally pulled back, leaving that patina in the recessed areas of the part. And that just gives a, a very nice, realistic look of a very aged, oxidized piece of real copper. Now, once we've done this technique, we have several options we could do from here. We could then seal that with more protective lacquer, or in this case, we're going to take it again a step further. So we could stop here, and again, we'd have a very nice looking piece, or we can take it a step further. And I really wanted this to have the look of old, oxidized, antique copper. So what I decided to do over the top was to give it a... Uh, a darkened look using some of our black wax. This is some of our black metal wax. And again, this is a protective wax that once it cures, once it dries and cures completely, gives us a very strong protective coat on the surface of our part. So what we're going to do is just stipple that all over the surface of our part, over the uh, copper B and over that lacquer and everything. And initially, it's just going to look like a black mess when we put that on. But as soon as we get that applied all over the part, we want to then pull back that excess wax with a clean paper towel or a clean soft cloth. And what that will do is give us uh, just, again, some of that wax in the deep recessed areas and a little bit more of a, uh, a newer look in the high points of the piece. Now, it's important when you do this technique that you pull back those uh, high points as soon as possible and wipe it down with a soft cloth or paper towel as soon as possible because this is a very strong wax and it has really good adhesion to pretty much any surface it's applied to. If you let it too long, it will do exactly what it's designed to do, which is lock onto that surface underneath. So make sure you take the time to wipe that and pull it back as soon as you can before it completely sets. Now, again, we're gonna do one more step to it once we've pulled back uh, the excess wax and gotten it uh, back to the look that we want overall, we're going to let that cure completely for that wax usually takes about three or four hours to really dry and cure.
And once we've let it hit that state, we can take some 4 aught steel wool, this is some ultra-fine steel wool, and pull back any more excess wax. And now that winds up giving us a very refined piece with a, more of a, a realistic antique copper because we pulled back any of that excess black or any of the excess green on the high points and we're left with a very nice antique oxidized copper look. Now you'll find that if you follow these directions that we did in this video, the powdering of the mold and the proper application of the primate and then the metal coating, if you follow those directions accordingly, you get a really good bond between the metal coating and the resin piece. And of course, as usual, all of the stuff we used in this video is available on our web store. You can find the new BR75D resin in our casting resin section. And of course, the Sculpt Nouveau section has all the metal coatings, patinas, and waxes. And you can find that all on our web store at brickintheyard.com. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, we post a lot of this stuff on Instagram. So if you want to see some of the uh, projects that we're working on around our shop or uh, just some of the things that don't make it into a tutorial, uh, be sure to check us out on Instagram at instagram.com slash supply.